I've been using the RP diet to fuel my weightlifting performance for years, and RP's simple, science-based approach has been instrumental to my success. With the new RP Diet app, following RP's principles is as easy as entering my goals and schedule and choosing my favorite foods. The app builds a diet to my exact needs, reminds me to eat my meals, and adapts to my body's changes every single day and week. The RP Diet app is a huge help in my quest to become the best athlete I can be, and if your goal is to be your best, it will help you. Folks, we're back. I'm back. I'm the one who's been fucking it up this whole time, but finally... I have enough DSL internet to do another webinar. We're here, Dr. James, Dr. Mike, RP webinar, finally, coming at you from the beautiful state of Montana. Dr. Mike, how are we doing? Oh, I tried to leave this meeting by accident. Um, <laughs> doing well. That would have been a bad start. <laughs> Bye. Uh, doing well. I live in a house in Las Vegas, Nevada now for the next year because my wife is doing a sports medicine uh, fellowship program. I was going to say residency. That would be insulting if she just graduated residency. Uh, and then we also have a live-in bomb roommate, Jared Feather. And Boo. So, yeah, he's good for sex and not much else. Um, mm. But that's been fun. He's nice to look at. He's very nice to look at, as long as you zip the lip, and that's good. Uh, so that's been fun. <laughs> and we're training at a new gym, and Las Vegas is actually great. There's so many places to eat and the weather's always the same and very nice. It's just a little hot, but my wife did win that bet. The dry heat definitely is different than like the humidity bullshit. Um, yes, that's true. I thought it would be oppressive, but it's only oppressive when the sun is in your face. When the sun's not in your face, like if you're in the shade, it's like they say it's a hundred. And like, that's not really a hundred. Um, you can't get dehydrated super easily because you don't ever sweat and you're like, I'm fine. And then you're peeing brown. You're like, oh, I'm not fine. Okay. Um, yeah. Especially like in Vegas too, it's natural to, to go drinking and stuff too. And like the next thing you know, you have like a couple beers and you're fucked. 100%. 100%. 100%. Um, so in any case, enough about me personally. We have some big news to announce. Um, good, good news, bad news. Yeah, guys. So good news, bad news. So uh, again, I apologize for the delay. That was, uh, was my bad on my end, but we just didn't have a stable internet situation. And, and frankly, it's still not that great, but it's enough to get this done. So sorry for that. But going forward, we're going to make some changes. Uh, this will be the last week where we're asking you guys to submit questions via RP plus as you have been in the past. And then from that point on, what we're going to start doing is wrapping up any of the questions that Mike and I have not answered from RP plus up to that time. And then we're going to start asking you guys to post the questions on YouTube. And then you're going to have um, kind of a democratic moderation of the questions yourself. So democratic Mike socialism, and, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what we're going to do is um, people will post questions on the, the most recent weekly webinar video. And then we're going to take the top 10, which uh, was vote uh, based on upvotes. So if you guys see questions that you're really interested in, you're going to upvote them. You can certainly submit your own questions. But if they don't get upvoted and they make their way kind of to the bottom of the list, they might not get answered. So essentially what it's going to be is uh, for the next couple of weeks, Mike and I are going to wrap up all the RP plus questions that we have not answered to date since we were kind of backlogged a little bit. So we're going to make sure we get all the questions that were submitted answered uh, July 7th. Uh, Tuesday, July 7th, I believe, will be the last date that we will be combing the, um, the forums for questions. So make sure if you guys are RP Plus members, if you have any outstanding questions or you've been sitting on some like, ah, I didn't really feel like asking, maybe somebody else will ask, or I don't want to pester and with my own personal questions, no, get it in. Make sure you put it on there. And then after that, what we're going to do is switch to a more YouTube focused uh, format where people can upvote questions that they think are really important. Yep, and we're only going to answer... Ooh, we're only going to answer 10 questions per week on YouTube, but it's going to be the top 10 and it's uh, going to be which ones get the most votes. And unless we've covered that question that's getting the most votes like 600,000 times before, and they will just sort of like, we'll just refer like, Hey guys, we didn't answer this one because of that. Or if it's like stupid incel humor uh, and it's just not good incel humor, it's bad incel humor. Um, then we won't answer the question, but you know, LOL, I'm sure other people are laughing with you as you continue to not have sex with people voluntarily. What are incel plant balls made of? Incellulose. Incellulose. Exactly. Woo. That was pretty good. That was good. That, that was, was a good incel joke. That was all right. Shall we? I got uh, I got a case of the incellulitis. Yeah. Let's uh <laughs> <laughs> let's let's uh, enough bullshit. To questions, since the, the people are hungry for questions, I'm sure. Uh, I don't even remember how to fucking do this anymore. Okay, here we go. Screen share. 
All right. Shazam. We got some spicy names this week. Yeah, some a lot of Brazilians, it seems like. It's all Brazilians. What the fuck? Awesome. How do you say that? I would say Caio Lujero. Is that how you how would you say it? Lujero? Lujero? That's what yeah, Lujero? that's what I think. Caio Lujero. <laughs> all right. Caio says, Hey Docs, I would like to know your thoughts on a Physiological mechanisms that explain why MPS decreases as someone is getting closer to their genetic ceiling. A potential explanation could be that muscle fibers increases are not proportional to ribosome biogenesis, and then he cites some gentleman, meaning that ribosome number per fiber doesn't change much, but fiber CSA does. I don't know if there isn't a definitive answer, but I would like to know if this explanation seems reasonable, if something else could explain this. I actually have absolutely no idea. I've never even thought about the subject of exactly what mechanistically uh, explains the fact that you have uh, a ceiling uh one thing could be this isn't like so conceiving of muscle growth is exclusively uh, described by mps muscle protein synthesis is to building skyscrapers uh muscle building synthesis is to mps is to building muscle what the number of bricks shipped to manhattan is to building skyscrapers like yes the more bricks are shipped the more skyscrapers hypothetically being constructed it's a lot more complex than that so one of the limiting factors we do know about is that when you only have a certain number of satellite cells. And once you run out of those and they've all filled up, there's, you know, and we know that there's myonuclear domain control. I'm not exactly sure how the myonuclear domain control happens, but at a certain cell size, the nucleus just refuses to grow the cell anymore uh, for obvious reasons that it would be non-functional or incrementally less functional. And we know that when you maximize the myonuclear domain size of every single satellite cell, uh, then you just don't grow anymore. So instead of thinking of it as MPS, we can think of it as total muscle growth. And it's kind of like the way you think about this is if every square block of Manhattan has the tallest possible skyscraper that technology can allow, then you just don't build any more skyscrapers because you're like, well, we can't, the fucking elevator shaft will just fall, but the thing will topple over. So we can't build anymore. So that's basically uh, looking at it like that. That's my, my only sort of statement on that. And I think there are, there are probably, um, I suspect they are deep, uh, internal, uh, I want to say designed, evolved, right? Uh, rate limiting steps and net caps on muscle growth that are not just the processes that grow muscle have just uh, sort of fizzled out and can't keep up. Because I'll tell you this, uh, with the amount of training that farm can recover you from and the amount of raw stimulus the farm itself provides and the fact that humans can eat an inordinate amount of food means that if the only thing stopping you from gaining muscle was the fact that you were insufficiently bathed in testosterone derivatives and you didn't, you can't, couldn't eat the food and you couldn't train hard enough. All those things are, are, are solved problems. And, but we still see with the most non natty bodybuilders that there is a limit to size. There's just a certain size people just can't get to. And some people, for example, Marcus rule comes to mind. He was enormous, a uh, huge bodybuilder, but his so triceps, huge. yeah, his triceps never really did grow all that much as much as he wanted them to. And at a certain point they just stopped growing. And he said he tried everything and they just wouldn't grow. And I believe him and it is, you know, all, all of his other muscle groups grew really well, but he, you know, something was up with his triceps where it wasn't just a matter of more training and more food and more drugs because he had all those things in spades and it just, they wouldn't grow. And that does happen for the whole body at the get muscle to muscle to muscle level. So I, th I think there are definitely those mechanisms are not very well studied. Um, but it also very depressing to study, but hypothetically, so and here's the thing, right? Real quick. If you studied them well enough to turn them off, you would be in a really interesting scenario where they may be there for your physical safety and for cellular function. Like it could be like, if you turn them off, all of a sudden your muscle cells become cancerous. <laughs> that would be really bad. So there's, those are things that you play with, but very carefully. And, and that's what happens with people who have myostatin deficiencies is they just get rampant cancer because the, the micro RNAs associated with myostatin are all over the place. So I, I agree with Dr. Mike. Uh, I don't, I'm not, I, I definitely recognize that that mechanism could be at play though. I'm skeptical because um, protein synthesis has autocrine and paracrine effects, meaning it affects the things within the cell nearby the cell and could have effects downstream within the body. So I don't really feel like the ribosomal density is necessarily the limiting factor to muscle growth. It's not like capillary density or mitochondrial biodensity where there are logistical factors to things moving in and out of the cell. Since the, the protein synthesis affects all parts of the cell, I don't really see how the density of those ribosomes would have a huge effect on that. And I think the kind of the more MRV model of why genetic ceilings exist 
makes the most sense and is probably the most validated at this point, which really is a dose response training age problem where at some point, the amount of training stimulus you need to continue making gains exceeds your work capacity and or your ability to recover from said stimulus. And that, that is undoubtedly true. We know that for sure. Yeah. Why that limit exists there's, there's, re, there's a, a number of reasons that we could explore. We're not entirely sure, but that is at least for now, I would say like a 98% safe bet on why you stop growing at some point. And simply because the amount of training that you need is no, is, is just more than you can actually do from this point on. Yeah. But uh, like I sort of explained earlier, if you manage to overcome that with an inordinate amount of drugs and food, there is still a limit. Now the limit's much higher. Like if you naturally are 45 years old and your natural testosterone, if you just use the kitchen sink, you'll grow fuck 50 pounds of muscle. Um, but then it will stop still. So there's, it's not just a matter of, of being able to recover from training. There is more to it than that. There are probably hard limits, but so I guess it's kind of cool that there are hard limits because then you can actually say you've reached your genetic ceiling in some objective way. And there could be like evolutionary limitations to that as well, where just like at some point, just being that muscled is energy inefficient and actually costing you your, not only your longevity, but acutely, like you might just be so muscled that you're less fit to survive. No such thing. (laughs) All right. Number two, what could be the limiting factor of the ah. maximum amount of volume that can be performed in a single session in order to maximize hypertrophy on a single set? Oxygen is allowed to produce ATP. When oxygen is mm. low and fatigue increases, high threshold motor units need to be recruited to maintain force output and tension is produced, causing maximum hypertrophy. It would be correct to assume that there may be a maximal capacity to utilize oxygen for producing ATP on a certain muscle for a given session. Therefore, oxygen levels won't get low. Mm. It's uh, uh, yeah. and high threshold motor units will be recruited if hypertrophy may be impaired. Well, so uh, that's a part of it. So high threshold motor units actually uh, tend to get recruited less and less the more high acid the environment is, uh, the more metabolites generate. It actually fucks the high threshold motor units more hilariously. And what is in, 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 sort of part of the design is they actually generate the most metabolites and also get fucked over by the most metabolites. Um, so it's kind of a self-limiting problem. And but- it's, it's noteworthy that, sorry, it's noteworthy that, that that limitation is not due to lack of oxygen. It's due to the byproducts of anaerobic metabolism. It's yeah. not that you are, you don't have enough oxygen flowing through the system. It's that the energy systems that you're using to produce high energy output are inherently anaerobic. Even if you had a huge saturation of oxygen, there's a logistical limit in terms of how oxidation can produce enough, it can resynthesize ATP. It takes a significantly longer time for that process. So your body will still preferentially use the anaerobic ones for high power and high force activities, muscle building activities. Yeah, 100%. And also that doesn't actually limit your uh, per session ability to grow muscle um, because you can always rest and do more sets. Uh, what limits your maximum adaptive volume uh, it's, it's not, so it says, what could be the limiting factor for the maximum amount of volume that can be performed in a single session? The real hard limit of that is, is muscle injury and rhabdomyolysis. Like at some point you will just become injured and your muscles will degrade and go into the bloodstream and you could die. But up until that point, you can continue to train. It'll just be incrementally stimulus to fatigue ratio will fall as you continue to train and eventually become negative, essentially, um, costing you gains. Uh, but the, the big factor there is damage. Um, at a certain level of muscle damage, you are just, uh, you're sorry, at a certain level of training volume, any more volume in that session is causing incrementally so much more damage that it actually dips into your recovery adaptive resources and makes you less jacked after that session is over. So that's the realistic limit. Um, and uh, you can continue to train, uh, but it won't be productive training. And there are like bioenergetic limitations as well, not, not nearly as profound as like the damage one, but like, so ultimately like you're going to be producing products in terms of uh, like energy output products that are going to start having downstream inhibitory effects on muscle contraction and, and force output that nothing can in that short amount of time can remedy outside of just rest, right? So essentially when you're lifting, you're creating a huge energy deficit, right? That your body literally cannot keep up with. And that's why you have to stop. And ultimately when your body recognizes, hey, I have all these bioenergetic products in a much greater ratio than the reactants themselves, I'm actually gonna start inhibiting a lot of these different enzymes involved in 
high force, high power output energy production to prevent catastrophe. And this is completely normal. There's no amount of oxygen that's going to stop that from happening. That's the thing. So there are a lot of limitations as to why that happens. So ultimately, you can just think of it as like, once you start, you're on a time bomb because you're eventually going to start accumulating products and your body's going to start recognizing and say, you know what, I got to start shutting some of this shit off. Things aren't going so well. All right. Eduardo Tronco Perella. Jesus, spicy Perella. Christ. Hi, Docs. Duke on the block here. First, thank you for all the freaking knowledge you both enlightened us with. Question regarding how to proceed with a deload on vacation. I'm right now in my second week of hypertrophy meso. I've programmed in such a way that the vacation coincides with my pre-planned deload week. The thing is, I'll be 10 days away without having access to weights, just some calisthenics in the park. How would you proceed? A, hitting the bars in my deload week and at least <laughs> I thought <laughs> I thought he meant like going out drinking that's what I thought <laughs> and at least doing some circuits pull-ups dips handstand push-ups and having some fun in general while eating a maintenance B not doing anything at all maintenance diet of course dropping fatigue like a motherfucker and starting my second hype hypo mezzo fresh as a teenager um i would think that if it's not terribly inconvenient you can absolutely go two times during that time and do some dips and pull-ups and some lunges and stuff uh and uh, get a little bit of a workout in and probably help you recover even faster um and keep you nice and limber for when you come back uh james yeah i think you know option option a is probably the best but option c which is like the dr james and dr mike keeping it real like you, homie, you're on RP plus, you're asking intelligent questions. You're telling me you can't drop in for two training sessions somewhere, right? Like make it happen. You can do it. Yeah. So the best option is actually getting to a gym about two or three times. Second best is the calisthenics. And then last is the time off. Unless the, either one of those options comes terribly insignificant or terribly inconvenient to you. Ben. Listen, I've been to the Arctic fucking circle like three times and I have found a place to drop in and train. You can find a place. I know you're on vacation, but obviously training is important enough to you to drop a question on RP plus. That means it's probably important enough to you to pay the 10 to 25 bucks to do a drop in deload workout. Bam. Yeah. All right. Second question. How much of an interference effect can walking have in potential leg muscle growth? My case, I do every day because of work between 20 and 30,000 steps. I've noticed that my hamstring MRV is super low in comparison with other muscles, but I wouldn't know if that's due to an interference effect or not. They lag a bit when comparing them to my quads. Uh, usually after training, they take longer than any other muscle groups to recover. There's always a lagging soreness due to too much movement outside the gym, I suppose. Uh, I don't think that's a big deal. Actually, if you walk that much, your MRVs usually go up, but you experience less hypertrophy because your work capacity goes up because you're more slow twitch dominant. I wouldn't say that MRV will go down. MRV will go down when you do higher intensity stuff, jogging, cycling, uh, sprinting, then your MRV will noticeably go down. But if you're walking in you know, the first couple of weeks of walking, just the sheer magnitude of the effort is going to temporarily decrease your MRV. But after some number of weeks and months, your MRV is going to be the highest it's ever been. And that's not a very good thing because you can recover from more but you, the thing you did to recover from more training is you did way too much slower twitch fiber, uh, essentially reconversion, James. Yeah. And so I think kind of getting to Dr. Mike's point there, if, if you did that, like at once every two weeks, yes, that would be kind of a, a problem. But the thing is, if you're doing it every day, you acclimatize to that really quickly and it's really no longer a problem anymore, like Dr. Mike already said. So if it was kind of an incidental thing, like, yeah, you're going to have issues for that week or two. But once you kind of get into that habit, then your numbers just adjust. And I don't think it's going to be much of a problem for you. You might just have to, I mean, this, the process is still the same going through the MEV, MRV, auto-regulating your way there. It's the same thing. You just have a higher daily average workload than most people. Okay. Number three, currently I'm in a five-day split. I'm going to start working night shift once per week. Due to the fuckery to my biorhythm on those days, usually I wake up every day at 5 a.m., go to bed at 22 a.m. <laughs> uh, what is that, 10? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'd say the most logical approach would be to split the workouts in such a way throughout the week that the day of the night shift and the next day I don't go to the gym. Working out my split normally during the other five days. Would you agree? Appreciate any suggestions. Um, uh, so I'll, yeah, that sounds like a good idea, but I would say you can come up with that idea or maybe better ones by figuring out when during the week 
you can both train the hardest and when afterwards you can recover well. And that could be like a, if after a night shift, you get uh, some time in the middle of the day and then you take like a huge long sleep. If you're a very motivated uh, person and you, there's muscle groups that you can train with relative ease, like the work capacity and degree of effort's never the limiting factor, it's recovery ability, it's totally possible to train after a hard days, uh, hard nights work, and then and then go to sleep, eat a bunch of food, go to sleep for twelve hours, and be super fucking anabolic. Whereas on the other hand, if if you're someone who recovers just fine, but it's you really have to have tons of energy to train, maybe your last day should be before that night shift sort of thing. So it really depends on on those two, which one of those is a limiting factor. And if both are limiting factors to roughly even extent, then you you should probably just avoid the uh, that window altogether as much as you can for training. Yeah, I agree. This might not be a cut and dry thing where it's like, oh, this will definitely be the best day to train hard. And these are the best days to train lighter. It's just one of those kind of things you might find that some days just happen to work better than others. And it, it might not be a predictable thing. So I would guess and check a little bit. That's the only, the only real option. James, that was baller shit because you were about it towards the end, but it wasn't full robot voice. It was just real slow. So you're like, that's the only real option damn it that's pretty man cool. i'll so, probably have to let you let you take the reins on most of these for now just because my internet situation is wonky that was that came out great all right let me take the reins and you know uh, i'll stop after everyone and you say yes proceed or, or if i just like cut out or anything just keep going because remember when we did the practice one like i cut out and then it just yeah you it, for, it kept recording for whatever reason so just yeah. fuck james just keep going all right the show Adrian goes on. Dinali says, hey, fellas, how are you doing? I just want some recommendations of where to go learn about cardio prescription along with a more in-depth mechanistic explanation for cardio itself. To get a little more context of the question, I don't understand the differences of cardio prescription, more specifically why, when, and who to prescribe different modalities. I'm from a resistance training background, so cardio to me is death. And whilst I'm here, any recommendations for resistance training modalities uh, would be appreciated. So our book, The Scientific Principles yeah. of Strength Training, is good for that. For cardio, I would probably look to Alex Viata's book, The Hybrid Athlete. Uh, uh, James, what do you think? Yeah, and The Hybrid Athlete is wonderful. I've read it. If you, um, most of the literature reviews on high intensity interval training do a nice job summarizing all of the kind of basic cardio stuff, and they give tons of links in, in terms of where to find more information. So if you go and just do like lit reviews on, on HIT training for cardio, they'll usually give a really good breakdown as to like what the benefits of low intensity cardio are, what the benefits of moderate intensity cardio are, what the benefits of interval training are, and then high intensity interval training specifically. So those are really good places to kind of like jump off and just find different wormholes to go through because it's, it's just like resistance training. There's all sorts of shit to talk about. There's volume considerations, intensity, frequency, you know, all sorts of stuff. Same thing for cardio. And um, just as much as we talk about the volume landmarks and MRVs and, and stuff for weight training, there's just that there's just as many things to talk about for cardio. And I find those are usually the most useful places to kind of jump off from because they, they don't really talk about hit training without talking about the other forms of training. So good place to start. Excellent. All right. Next up, Colin Hudson. Hi docs. Uh, number one, I'm currently deloading for meso two in the male physique template and I'm going to start 14 week cut next week. Should I repeat meso one? Uh, and yes, you should. And two, yep. And increase initial set volumes and just auto regulate from there. I wouldn't really increase initial set volumes. I would start nice and low because you got a whole cut to increase them if needed. And yes, do auto regulate. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is like you might consider doing an initial set increase if like if you go do your MRV, your MEV thing, and you're kind of just like feeling flat. But that's again, that's more of an issue of auto regulation, not not necessarily a pre planned. Yeah. Um, that would be an incentive too, but you don't have to do that. Yeah. Colin Hudson says, oh, oops, uh, second question. I was going to skip him. Uh, also, should I, also, should I do have maintenance calories for the deloads? Yes. Always <laughs> maintenance for the deloads. Always maintenance for the deloads. All right. Magnus says, hello. My understanding is that maintenance phases are generally recommended when transitioning from massing to conventional cutting phases because of muscle settling points, among other things. Why is this not the case before mini cutting? Uh, what ensures that we don't just lose the recent muscle 
and preparatory structures gained in a prior mass is just the duration of prime factor concern. Yes, the duration and the total amount of weight lost. But as you see in the mini cut manual book, the longer mini cuts, uh, the ones later in the uh, whole uh, macro cycle actually do have maintenance phases before them. It's just very short maintenance phases. So uh, the, that's the answer. John yeah. Serene. Did you want to say something, James? Uh, nothing, nothing enlightening. It was just, again, like the, the, the training is also adjusted slightly at the um, mini cut where it's not trained at the normal maintenance volumes. It's like what would be MEV volume. So you do kind of get the benefit of slightly harder than what would normally be maintenance volume training. Yeah. John Serene, Serene. Question, currently my priority goal is training as a rock climber. In the name of the game, Yes, cool. He is first developing heat strength and power and then building power endurance for longer climbs. I do understand that you guys aren't climbing experts, but I'm really curious to hear your hot take on this because the climbing specific scientific literature is extremely small. So there could be some potential or something from weightlifters. The number one challenge with training for climbing is recovery of the finger tendons and pulleys, as well as the bicep insertion. This would not surprise me. Number one, what would you change or consider training for sport where connective tissue is the star of the show, you really never hit a systemic MRV or local musculature MRV. My first answer would be like, really know what your connective tissue MRV is and make sure not to exceed it uh, and use connective tissue specific signs of MRV. Like you're getting increasingly more joint and connective tissue pain and, and stiffness and it's in, 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 interfering with your ability to perform your climbs at a normal pace and normal difficulty level, James. So yes, I agree. And um, the thing with climbing is that people often just assume that climbing is like its own thing. And really you would approach climbing like you would approach any other sport where you have some basic fitness. You're trying to develop work capacity during some times of the muscles, the joints, the tendons of all the, the agonist muscles. You're also trying to develop some basic skills, some drills, and then eventually some tactics. So the key with developing the, um, the connective tissue strength with, uh, the, the hands and for climbing is to treat it like you would other treat other sports where at some point in your training, you're building them up, you know, using work capacity type training. And then you're starting to incorporate your skill work, right? But you're never exceeding the actual tissue capacity in terms of load. You're actually cognizant of things like MRV, right? Then you start incorporating drills into your skill work where you take some basic things like, okay, I was working on this grip, this foot, this type of climb, right? And now I'm working on maneuvering from this position to this position over and over again, being cognizant again of like your, not only your muscles, but your connective tissue MRVs. And then you start incorporating your tactics, which is actually like doing some submaximal to, you know, close to maximal effort climbing stuff over time. And if you are doing those things kind of systematically, rather than just saying, I'm a climber, that means I climb all the time. And I, I do weights to try and supplement my climbing. You will find that that works a lot better where you can actually focus on certain things and build up your tolerance to training in those positions just by spending specific time doing skill work, drill work, and then eventually moving into what we would call tactics, which is actually doing your like live climbing later on. My, I don't know climbing that well. I know a few climbers and my, what I have seen is that they generally just try to climb all year. They don't actually focus on a lot of specific skills or drills and then kind of ramping up their climbing stuff. So just like, what Mike and I, when people say like, how do I, how do I get like my power endurance in my calves for soccer? What's the answer to that? It's like, well, you progressively work on your fitness and then you start increasing your soccer training and then your soccer training basically covers that for you, right? Same thing here. So you work on your fitness, you work on your skills, your tactics, you build work capacity. And then ultimately your climbing training is what governs the recoverability uh, of those things using the same tools that we always do. Sorry, that was a long winded rant. Did that make sense? Perfect sense. Actually, all almost entirely answered the second question. And I might, uh, I might actually steal this question for. Uh, I might steal next time I do a James does sports episode. I might do climbing because that one was an interesting question. Yeah. So you almost answered the second question too. How would you recommend training for hypertrophy of the forearms and pulling muscles in order to potentiate future strength gains? Climbing itself for sports specific strength training is terrible for hypertrophy. Finger curls after a climbing session seems low quality because they are already fried. Doing it before the session would negatively impact climbing performance. Doing it on a rest day would probably screw up recovery. I do sports specific training four times per week. We'll train every day if my tendons could take it, but alas, it would be the best compromise. So I think that, first of all, there's two questions there. How do you train your pulling muscles and how do you train your forearms? Uh, your pulling muscles can be trained with Versa grips, um, which you should purchase. 
uh, with absolutely no effect on your fingers whatsoever. Like you basically don't even fucking use your fingers when you use versa grips. And you can train those in probably after after your climbing sessions. Um, take 20 minutes, take a drink of Gatorade and protein, and then go hit a hard pulling session so that next time you recover from climbing, you're also recovered from that session. Um, you can train your forearms with wrist curls without really using your fingers much. So you can take a dumbbell, place it right here, not on your fingertips, and you can curl it up on a bench and curl it back down. And that trains your forearm musculature a ton and gives you general hypertrophy for all the exact same muscles that you use to move your fingers, but without fucking up your finger tendon. So you're saying Actually load the bar a little far, uh, more proximately than distally. Um, and uh, the training them right after the training is probably your best bet in the context which you supplied now. And lastly, to, to sort of uh, 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 spring upon what James said, there should be distinct times in your training where you're doing much more hypertrophy, much less climbing, and then vice versa. Because then remember, hypertrophy training can be maintained well by climbing but probably not increased optimally by climbing. Uh, so there's a time and a place to do both. Um, it's almost like saying, when can I have the most fun? Um, and when can I do the most work to make the most money? Well, you know, th there's a reason there's a five day work week and a two day weekend. One of those is for work, one of those is for fun and they both potentiate each other. Whereas if you just tried to like work six hours every day instead of eight, you would kind of ruin your fucking weekend and you probably wouldn't be focused on your job and burn out of that. So we don't always want to do the same program of climbing and lifting. We want to have times where it's more lifting, less climbing. And more climbing, less lifting. Yes, that's completely spot on. And then, so like during your hypertrophy phases, you might actually spend less time doing full scale climbing and spend more time just at the gym working on some basic skills and maneuvers that you haven't really been refreshing very much. So uh, it's, it's unrealistic to think that you can train your forearms up to like their hypertrophy MRV and expect to maintain the same climbing regimen that you did before. So uh, I think a, a wise maneuver at that point would be like, if I'm really focusing on beefing up my, my grip strength and my forearm muscles and their endurance there, I'm going to have a couple blocks of high, you know, maybe amongst other things like your biceps and other things, maybe you're not just doing like for, forearm, forearm specialization phase that might be a little, not quite enough uh, to justify mass. But at, during that time, you might just take like your, 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 your full scale climbing or your live climbing down to like a maintenance volume where you maybe just do like one big climb per week. And then the other training that you're doing is mostly just like working on skills and positions that you uh, either find that are not good for you or that you just haven't really practiced much before and you're trying to expand your repertoire of skills. That would be wow. a, a smart move on what I, what I would consider to be a smart training style. So bonus round um, and what's his name? John, we got uh, yes, it's the right question on the right day because we got all sorts of ideas. Here's another cool idea you can implement to your climbing, climbing training. Um, the, you could do the following. You say that your fingers and your finger tendons and bicep tendons are a sort of a limiting factor for climbing. But unfortunately, or or whatever it is, it's not the only factor in climbing. So I can think of at least a couple of factors you can train in climbing during various phases of the last several weeks when you deprioritize how much you use your fingers and your hands and how much of a limiting factor that is and you prioritize other things. For example, in climbing, uh, the rapidity of a climb can be something you can train. Like it might not be a finger technical climb or finger demanding climb, but how quickly can you get up the climb? There's another one where there's reach climbing where like you could have a really good perch and this doesn't hurt your fingers at all, but you really got to reach and learn how to extend your body. If you combine that with a time climb of doing that quicker, holy fuck, like it doesn't matter if your hands are perfectly grippy. Like, look, like James and I have really great grip. I guarantee you we suck dick at climbing because it's not the fact that our fingers suck. It's the fact that I don't know where to put my fucking feet fast enough for, you know, and here's another one. Same reason uh, why we suck at swimming. We just, we're not good at it. We haven't practiced. Right. And, and uh, another one you could do is, you know, climbing is much, much harder when you're heavier. So what you can do is actually load yourself on uh, courses in which the grip strength is not remotely limiting factor. Like, you know, when you get those grip at the climbing gyms, the, the gripper thing that goes all the way over and you're like, I could fucking do a one arm pull up on this thing, right? Not the ledge grip or whatever, but the full grip. Uh, if you have a climbing gym access and especially some uh, climbing gyms will let you put your own pegs wherever the fuck you want for real advanced guys and you get to choose which pegs you have. Um, do that, put a fucking weighted vest on and during your hypertrophy meso or whatever, climb in such a way that it really doesn't fuck with your fingers much um, and work that's on- a, being, That's an excellent suggestion. Yeah, work on just climbing at 20 pounds heavier than normal and going for real reach and real distance and real technical transitions and faster. Then once you're good with that, 
is you're going to be just a fucking better climber. And during that time, you've been jacking up your fingers. But then you slowly retransition into technical climbs in which the finger perches are the limiting factor. But all of a sudden, you have all this reserve capacity of better coordination, better strength. Uh, you're used to climbing heavier. And if you're used to climbing heavier, oh my God, taking that 20 pound vest off, you're going to be fucking Spider-Man, right? Um, so without hurting your fingers the entire time. So don't just assume that you'll always have to use finger limited climbing. Um, you can do a little bit better than that and vary it up. Yeah, that was a really good suggestion. Okay. Uh, let's see. Number three. The only deloads that exist in the rock climbing world is tapering before a competition or a big trip a few times a year. No, that's that's just you guys being knuckleheads. That's all that is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there, more deloads can exist. Maybe uh, that's the best way to do it since it's a skill sport. More time spent practicing is always a benefit. That, that's not true. It's not always a benefit. Like not necessarily. No. Uh, or maybe people just train like that because there's not much research available to make better methods. Like this is how people train with all non-research things. They just train as much as possible. The survivors win because they're still the survivors. What's your intuition on setting up macro cycles aimed purely at the physical side of climbing strength, power, power endurance? I think that that the, that question is one that's actually very easy to answer. It's a, just a traditional model. It's totally fine. Let's address the actual contention in, in your question is the deloads thing. Um, you should absolutely be fucking taking deloads for climbing. If nothing else, take finger deloads every... Yeah, I was going to say, that's why your fingers are fucked up, dude. Every X, number, <laughs> right? every X number of weeks, every X number of weeks that your fingers really start to get fucked up, take a fucking finger deload. So there's no research on how much, uh, how much deloading to take from jujitsu, right? And I jujitsu, which by the way, fucks up your fingers at least as much as climbing does. Um, how often do I take deloads from that? Well, what I'll do is I'll figure out when my fingers can't fucking take it anymore. And that's roughly every four to eight weeks. So every other deload for hypertrophy training, I also deload from jujitsu. Um, and sometimes I can deload in the cool way in which I just switch to all no-gi training instead of gi. And then no-gi training doesn't fuck your fingers at all. So I get good, great jujitsu training, just like that no finger limited climbing I was talking about. Uh, but at the same time, it, it uh, limits my, it really frees up my fingers. So that's, that's something you can consider. But the, the answer to all deloads it fundamentally is, uh, you know, when you need them and you should be taking them when you need them. And if you're training intentionally so easy that you only need them when you compete, you're training too easy. All training should be pushes and then we're coming back, push and come back, push and come back. Uh, so you should take deloads. My guess is once every 48 weeks is probably something, but if it's more often that you need to take them, then maybe that's the right idea. Yeah, and it might be one of those things where maybe maybe you are pushing an appropriate overload, but you're never getting enough recovery time. Like your muscles are recovering, but your tendons aren't. And that's why your fingers are fucked up all the time, right? And so you might just, what you might find is that you train the same way, let's just say roughly the same way. Maybe you took some, some pointers here from Mike and I, uh, but you just added a deload every, let's just say every five weeks. Um, you, what you might find is that your performance is just as good as it was before. And now you're just, your fingers aren't as fucked up all the time. Like that's one of those things where it might have simple but tangible benefits to just taking that lighter week of just not going quite as hard. You might not interfere with your training much. It might, it actually might pay giant dividends where you're actually having better training as a result of just taking that extra time off. But I would guess that it would be largely the same with less pain, which is kind of what you're going for. So I would start thinking about it. Climate training is really fascinating that we're on it. You could, I, ho I hope some of the guys are doing this. You could have very specific training of like weighted vest, big reach, huge differences in heights, but really easy to grip. And then the other one could be like bouldering essentially with the worst grips possible. So you can boulder, 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 jump off, boulder, 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 jump off and work only on your gripping stuff. Cause it sucks when you have a completely mixed course, but only one of your abilities is a limiting factor. You essentially slack on all the other abilities while just like if your finger strength or a technical ability to grip uh, weird objects is the limiting factor, you're never really getting challenged in your strength. You're never really getting challenged in your reach. And the only thing it's like, oh, well, why did you, why do you keep missing at that fucking junction? And they're like, well, my fingers, right? That means you have to climb all the way up to that junction, essentially face almost no challenge or a little bit with the other tougher ones. And then you fall off because of your fingers. Why can't you just boulder and do your fingers, right? I, I'm sure positive some people do that, but probably not enough. So figure out what your limiting factors are and do phases of specialization where you work on those. While in the meantime, just working on those, you can actually work on everything else if you intelligently split up what you need to do. So. Yeah, absolutely. And just keep in mind, like this, the issue here is again, like your training is exceeding the, your, the amount of training you're doing is, is exceeding the tissue's capacity to recover from. That's ultimately what you're doing. So 
In order to remedy that, you have periods where you're building up the tissues, that includes the muscles, the connective tissues, building them up to have a huge tolerance to training, and then making sport-specific transitions along the way, getting incrementally more and more and more looking like you know, competitive rock climbing. But the beginning of that training might look more like somebody who does recreational rock climbing and a lot of hypertrophy stuff. Yep. And then it will become less and less and less like that and more and more and more like rock climbing as you transition closer to your competitions or just, you know, whatever event that you got going on. 100%, 100%. And also just real quick, fuck this. Uh, you say rock climbing is a skill sport, you're completely correct. There are ways to train your skill without damaging your hands and shit a whole lot. Uh, and one of them is literally just like, um, I don't, I'm not sure if this is tenable, but it probably is. If you have someone pull on your the the rappel thing, the belay or whatever, Dick? Uh, you know, yeah, pull on your <laughs> cock. I'm like doing this on screen. If you have someone unload you, you could do very similar technical climbs unloaded, so that you can all of a sudden not have to do like put your body through the ringer, but you could still work on your limiting factor stuff, and you can work on your technique of climbing without uh, getting all the fatigue of being super fucking heavy. Right, so there's different ways to go about that. It's not just climbing. Uh, just climbing and doing lots of climbing is how most people train because most people are fucking thoughtless assholes. Just that one thought and they're fucking, just do this. And luckily the principle of specificity scoops their dumb asses up pretty well, but it doesn't scoop up the people who really want to improve the best. You know, like that's the, the biggest revelation of, of modern periodization is that you don't always just train your sport. There's other stuff you could be doing that's probably pretty good it's like posing hard for bodybuilding it's fucking stupid it's other shit <laughs> yeah and so um john i'm gonna have we're, you know uh let's see in august we're gonna have a draft zero of the the next volume landmarks book which deals with a lot of this kind of stuff where it's like how do you integrate skills tactics fitness into you know the volume landmarks and how do you put it into a training program so keep your eyes out probably in the next year or two that'll come out and it'll be pretty pretty on point with what you're looking for Diogo Simoes says, Hi, <laughs> Oh, I didn't know how to do that one. You nailed it. I wonder. Probably not. Uh, I have been training now for three years and have come a long way from a skinny 70 kilogram to 85 kilogram now, probably 50% body fat. It's really good. Cool. Especially, <laughs> Jabba says, oh, oh, oh. Uh, especially in the last oh, year, oh, I, oh. <laughs> I have learned a lot thanks to you guys. My physique is coming along nicely, except for some weird points. My lats and results are well developed, but my middle and lower traps are really lacking, and I can't seem to get them to grow properly during three years of training. I always did a lot of pull-ups, chin-ups, rows, deadlifts, etc. Do you have any insight in exercise selection? I should try. Let's see. Uh, middle and lower traps. Got it. Okay. Um, uh, I should thank you both for the knowledge and the free info you guys share. Really looking forward to your hypertrophy book coming out. Dr. Mike and Dr. James is a co-authored book. God damn it. Uh, sorry, I posted in the wrong place the first time. It's hard finding where the post questions when you're new here. Yeah, for sure. So my recommendation would be rows, all sorts of rows and specifically uh, hammer strength uh, rows um, and one arm dumbbell yeah. rows are really good because they allow you to ooh, protract and retract like crazy. And when you're at the top of the hammer rows or the one arm rows, want you to really arch up and then really protract and you're literally, that's what your middle and lower traps do. So uh, that would be my big recommendation. Don't lock your scabs, people say. That's what I was gonna say. Um, so what most people do on their rowing movements is they get into a good like arch position and then they lock their scaps into place and then it's just a lot of like arm movement. So what you really wanna focus on, whatever movement you pick, Maybe there are some that are better than others for you. That's, a, that's an SFR question. But more often than not, with the rowing movements, it's a technique issue, at least in my opinion, where people just aren't doing a good protraction retraction with the scapula. So what you might have to consciously do from this point on with whatever variations you choose is allow your scaps to actually protract. That's where your, sca your scapulas kind of come forward. And then retract really hard peak contraction at the top and then repeat every single time. Most people do their, rep, their first rep good, they start here, pro, retract, and then they're locked, and they just don't move anymore. And then it's just kind of like a shoulder extension, elbow flexion kind of thing. So yeah. that's probably the issue at hand. 100%. Kartik Singh says, if I'm only doing 18 sets for my back weekly, three times a week, 
should I uh, split the volume like six sets three times for, or one big session of 10 to 12 sets and the rest of it in a remaining session? Um, so I would say that roughly splitting your volume pretty evenly for hypertrophy is a really good idea. So I would say something like four to six sets in each session and some can be a little lower, a little higher, but I wouldn't do like one mega session and then two smaller sessions, James. Yeah, especially with the back where I feel like doing three sets of back is like kind of eh, like not much going on there. Uh, and then doing like 12 sets might be a little overkill. I really find that like five to 10 is that sweet spot on back where I feel like I got not just me, but people I work with, like we get good pumps, good, good productive performance increases. Sorry, I'm feeling stupid today. Um, I would say probably more of the six, six, six rather than the like 10 and then like four, four. Yeah. Um, and then Kartek says, can you give an example of a regional specialization routine for an intermediate trainee? Yes. It's actually in the RP website, the hypertrophy, uh, uh, hub, uh, hypertrophy guide, central hub or whatever, hypertrophy volume, central hub, or effects call, just Google all that shit. And there's going to be a sample routine in there. Um, and you're going to have enormous results. I, I can't help but think of like, I know he didn't mean that literally, but I just was thinking about like rear delt only specialization That's phase. Sweet, right? Six days of rear delt, <laughs> just nothing like, else. Like one set of day. squat. All fucking day. That's a rear delt. <laughs> oh man. All right. Henry Small says, hey docs, thanks so much for your answers last couple of weeks. It has been super helpful allowing me to structure my future training plans. There was a recent article on the 3DMJ page that critiques the idea of increasing volume weekly. Uh oh. Oh boy. <laughs> uh, I would love to hear your opinion on this. The basic premise was that there is not enough evidence to suggest adaptations occur so rapidly the volume should be increased weekly, and only significant changes that should be accounted for would occur at the beginning and end of the meso may actually only be a very small difference in volume. The suggestion was that with continuous progression and load slash reps per session alongside the accumulated fatigue, that there is no actually no necessity to increase volume week to week. How would you respond to this? Uh, it's easy. The long response is coming. It's being published like literally the next several days on the RP site, RP blog. We have a 13 point response to that view. Uh, you want to live even longer uh, theoretical uh, foundation, read the book James and I wrote called How Much Should I Train? If you read that book, then uh, discussions like these become a little bit of a wash. Um, but the best answer I can give you in a short time is if you ever in your program find yourself doing a certain number of sets at the appropriate progression in RIR that you're supposed to be increasing load and, and reps to keep your RIR where it's supposed to be between three and zero, if you ever find yourself in any weeks or sessions to be having very unimpressive pumps, a very unimpressive amount of muscular disruption to where you suspect that you are not actually training as hard as you could be to get remotely optimum per session gains, then you should probably add a set or two. <laughs> And if that's not true, don't add a set or two. And that's literally the end of the story. And if you end up, volume ends up going like this or like this or like that, then it's up to you using auto-regulation properly to continue to keep the training hard. At the end of the day, the only reason we increase load or increase reps uh, is to keep training sufficiently hard to be doing a good job. And that's the only reason we increase volume either. And all James and I are really trying to say, um, and myself, uh, James and Jared Feather, and uh, our, our boy, Ajuman Radhakrishnan, have co-authored this recent article, all we're trying to say is like, look, if you, if you, whatever set number you started out with in your muscle cycle could be not as many as you need towards the end to do the best job you can, it, will it still work? Probably, but it probably won't work optimally. Then again, like, look, if you don't increase your load through a meso, it's still enough weight to do a good job. If you don't increase your reps, it's still enough reps to do a good job. If there's no way in which the James starts squatting 315 for four by 10, he could just do 315, four by 10 for six weeks straight. And every single session will cause some measurable hypertrophy because it'd be less and less and less and less and less by a big factor. But if James does some kind of job to increase some of those variables, whether he does three, 315 by, not five by 10, but then six by 10 and seven by so on and so forth, whether he does that, whether it is increasing reps or load, uh, that will help keep the results better. Uh, and whether or not you use set progressions as a part of that is a very nuanced discussion that has as far as I can tell, very few or no categorical uh, problems with set additions. Uh, it's just that some folks just uh, think there's some downsides there that we just don't see. And and to give that to throw them some bones here, I think uh, you know in the sense if they're saying that like uh, adaptive resistance and adaptations to volume don't occur on this like massively short time scale, in some sense they're right. Meaning like um, if your MEV was three sets, 
within a mesocycle, your MEV is not necessarily going to be 10 sets, right? That's a massive shift. And, and, if they, and if that's kind of what they're saying, I agree. But I think what is fair to say is that there is enough acute adaptation from both changes in work capacity, changes in technique efficiency, and a variety of other factors where you do acclimatize to the actual movements and activities that you're doing. And a little bit more can be tolerated and also can be benefited from, which are two separate issues. Same so, as RAR, same as load, same as reps. Right. And so um, what we're saying is like the volume progression only takes you from your jumping off point to your auto-regulated finishing point. For some people, it's big. For some people, it's small. What we're not saying is that it should necessarily be like a 20 set pre-planned gap that you're spanning. And if that's, if that's what they're arguing, like I agree, right? It might only be like a four or five set progression or maybe even less than that for some people. And that's totally normal. For some people who are maybe more slow twitch, it might be a little higher. Um, but to ignore the fact that adaptive resistance and adaptations, acute, acute adaptations occur and could be mitigated by either increasing intensity and or volume, particularly volume for hypertrophy, it's just kind of silly. We all know that it happens. It's been demonstrated. And anyone who's ever been in the gym before knows that this happens, right? Three sets, one week. Anyone who, who just fucking got back to the gym in this quarantine who did two sets and got their soul crushed, and then they came back and did two or three sets the next time, and, and they felt like nothing happened at all. How do you explain that? It's How the long same are you going to keep doing two or three sets like that until someone's like, why don't you do more sets? Or like, because I wait until you're the end of Why? Uh, uh. Yeah. 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 It's just silly. So um, it, in the sense of like the, the volume progressions being these like outlandishly large progressions, I agree with them, but that's never what we've been saying. We were saying like they're auto-regulated and sometimes they're big, sometimes they're small, sometimes they're right in the middle. And the numbers that we put out are usually right in the middle and you adjust from there. Yeah. And they're always samples that we put out. So people have an understanding of where these kinds of things can happen. It, it's similar to how much load you should progress session to session. People say 2%, 5%, whatever. All those numbers are pretty fucking arbitrary, but they're pretty good averages to at least think about. And some people take that too far too and say, I have to put five pounds on the bar every time I train. What if you're not strong enough to do that? What if your reps fall off? And, and it's two and a half pounds for you or yeah. five pounds every other session or every third session. So, Or if you're you know, a low responder, like what do you do yeah, then? Yeah, 100%. <laughs> All right. Next question is in regards to extending a mouse cycle through auto regulation. If you still feel you have not hit MRV, if you are on your final pre-planned week and are working at zero to one RR, but feel towards the end of the week that you can carry on for another week before hitting MRV. Is it okay to push for an extra week at zero to one RR? Or should you do straight after your first zero to one RR week? Um, mm. Well, so this is a very, actually a very good question. There's two ways to go that I can see. Um, and James and I probably prefer one of those ways. Uh, one way to go is to completely auto-regulate them. If you're good to go, you're good to go. And that's a fine way to go. But uh, we were actually, Jared and I just did a podcast uh, with John Jewett and a couple other guys. And John Jewett, James is an IFB pro who's very evidence-based. He's a, a registered dietitian and everything. And we sort of, uh, he sort of all independently came to this conclusion that he actually deloads once every six weeks, no matter what, because he's like, I don't trust that my body knows what it's doing and it'll just fuck me up. And like, I'll feel great, great, great. And I'll, something will snap off. And I'm like, that's a fucking awesome thing. And I mentioned that you were a big fan of pre-planned deloads, like auto regulation within that scheme, but not at infinity. Um, and so uh, you can just continue to auto-regulate it. You'd probably be fine, but James and I usually prefer option two, which is just shut it down, take your deload, and then the next week, next meso, try the same, the same one, the same four weeks, let's say. And if on the next meso you also got to four weeks, you got to zero one or IR, and you felt like a fucking champion of the world, still deload, wash it away, and then the third meso, try five weeks. And then if five weeks you feel great and that's, oh, my God, oh, fucking beautiful, perfect number of weeks. <laughs> oh, fuck, a Philadelphia number. Can you see on this, Philly? Oh, um, I hate Philly. Get it out of here. <laughs> Still washing the filth of Philadelphia. Don't, don't worry, James. Philly hates you back. Good. Philly hates everyone. So, uh, but, but that's really the, the thing is uh, at some point, it's just, it's better safe than sorry. Um, we just don't like to advocate multiple weeks of grinding uh, to failure. And, but if you notice that, like, look, like, we could say three to one paradigm is the best, but a ton of people would reach three to one and be like, I can keep going. Then fuck them, keep going. Uh, but like, don't do it. Just make sure that you're really good to go and then go for it, James. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Uh, I think where most people get confused on this issue is they, they go pre-planned versus auto-regulated. And you don't have to pick one, you do both, right? And so the pre-plan says, you know what? 
uh, auto regulation saying like, maybe I can keep going. And like Mike said, I'm just going to cut it off this time, but I have some new information, which I'm going to feed forward into my next mesocycle. So maybe I didn't hit my MRV for whatever muscles are systemically. So maybe I'm going to actually increase my MEV and progress to a higher point on this next one. Or like Mike said, do a repeat, see if it happens again. There's a lot of different options there. Usually it's, it, you take that information, do what you planned on doing anyway, right? Which was a deload in this case, and then use it to either monitor or change the subsequent mesocycle that comes. And I think that's a much, much better strategy than just taking a hard line pre-planned or a hard line auto-regulated because that's the downside of, of both where you, pre-planned, you could overshoot or you can undershoot. Auto-regulated, same thing. Like both have that same flaw. They just come out in different ways. Why not use the information you get from both of them to get the best of both worlds? And in this case, it might err. You might err on the side of being slightly more conservative just to prevent unnecessary injuries and wear and tear, which Mike and I was a big fan of. Like if, if the question is like, can I push harder, but maybe hurt myself? Like, bro, come on. No, let's not do that. Yeah you'll find yourself doing that less and less the more advanced you get to because it's not just a matter of like, I feel pretty good. There's new weight, new number of sets on the bar. And you're like, Oh my God, like I have to do 505 and leg press instead of 500 for how many reps since I fuck that. I'm just dealing because <laughs> yeah. you think like, I, I feel good now, but there's no way I'm going to be able to do this. But if you honestly feel you can do it, then can it, deload anyway. And then the next meso or two mesos later when you're like, okay, this is a repeat pattern where four weeks of accumulation is clearly not enough for me. I think try fifth. And if that goes well, try it again. And if that goes well, Hey, you got a new thing. And then if you still need another week, then, you know, maybe you can think of six, six. Up. Mike, you've seen the movie Braveheart. Yeah. Remember when William the Longshanks was talking about the problem with Scotland? I don't, James. I was probably too ah. young when I saw that movie. <laughs> so he very clearly states, he's in a, like a war room meeting with his generals and stuff. And he's like, the problem with Scotland is that it's full of Scots. <laughs> That's how I feel about Philadelphia. The problem about Philadelphia is it's full of Philadelphians. Fuck you, you fucking fuck. I was a Philadelphian before you were. Don't you give me no, that, that I business. was born and raised on the fucking streets. <laughs> <laughs>
I didn't. I don't know. I didn't go. French. You food. didn't get extra credit. No, I hated French class. So it was French fries dipped in mayo. I assume was their entire menu. Ugh, dude, mayo. French food is funny because the French aren't even fat people, but their food cuisine is exclusively the most fucking fatty shit. But they—that's because they eat like once a day and they smoke cigarettes mostly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Here we. By the go. way, the the neighboring town from where I live is named French Town. Wow. The, uh, yeah. they, they ran dry on the well of funny uh, cool names, huh? <laughs> yeah. They're like, we've dipped into the, the Native American stuff too much. We're going a different awesome. route. French town. All right. My final question is, how would you program sumo deadlifts most effectively? If you were doing a variation of push-pull legs, what day would be best to play sumo deadlifts? Also, how would you contrib- contribute them to volume? Would it be a case that three sets of SLDLs means three sets for quads, hamstrings, traps, or back? Or would it look like 1.5 sets? So I get two easy answers, and then James can clean up for me. Unless, is that okay, James? Yeah, go for it. Okay, cool. Um, so I would do them on leg days, because properly executed sumo deadlifts are much more leg than they are back. Uh, and these are just like my best assessments, but fundamentally I'll end this with what a real a much better assessment is. And then for counting sets, you just need to know how much stimulus and fatigue they're causing. And that's something you can only auto-regulate. Like that's perceived stimulus to fatigue ratio. Um, you know, for example, it's almost certainly not three sets for quads because it's a partial movement for the quads. So maybe like 1.5 sets for each, maybe one. Like doing lots of stuff, stuff like that, let's honestly tell yourself how much quad stimulus and fatigue is happening. It's probably very little. Um, the glutes uh, could probably have a lot. Hamstrings, depending on how you pull, maybe have a moderate amount. Back, if you pull properly, not much. Um, but maybe some, and then, so all of these are going to be sort of different answers. So at the end of the day, the answers to both of where you want to place them and how much volume you want to count is really up to you and how you perceive the deadlift interacting with your body. Like if, if you do these sumo deadlifts in a way that doesn't interfere with your legs at all, but fucks up your back, put them on back day for the love of God and count them all for back. But if you do them in a way that fries your glutes, tears your adductors to hell, and barely t- t- touches your back at all, do them on leg days and count them a ton for glutes and, uh, and adductors. That was a really good answer. I think that's, that's one of those movements where you really need a recalibration all over because it's just a hard movement to program for. It, I think trying to partial uh, sets on the different muscle groups is largely a waste of time. It would be like, uh, it's the same thing with something like a push press. Like what does a push press count for? Is it like triceps or shoulders or quads or what back? It's just too much. It's just hard to figure out. So at that point, auto regulation becomes really handy. And if you're using some, some of your volume landmarks numbers, you're gonna do kind of a reset for that block. If you introduce a new goofy exercise like sumo deadlifts, it's just one of those ones where it's just too hard to, to pin down and you just have to adjust everything else accordingly because it's gonna have a downstream effect on everything else. So take your other muscle groups, know that you have kind of your rough MEV, MRV areas that you normally work with and then auto-regulate as a result of introducing this new crazy stimulus that you haven't really done that much of. Perfect. All right, Arin Salam has a few questions. Should I rapid fire these, James? Rapid fire. Quick hits. (laughs) Number one. How does stress slash cortisol affect water weight gain and why does it affect it? I'm not exactly sure why it affects it, but um, cortisol does seem, or high stress does seem to increase your water retention, but when it declines, the water retention falls off. Um, So when you're very, very stressed and you're trying to look for evidence of physique enhancement and body weight, are you yawning, James? Sorry, yeah, was it audible? I thought you were about to say something. Oh, no. Uh, and then, uh, so that just expect that. And when your stress reduces, just know that it's coming. Um, James cut yep. me off at any point. Okay. Number two, if the goal is to stay in MEV for as long as possible, why not just do some super low micro progression mesocycles or does that come with some problems? Uh, you incrementally increasing fatigue does not allow you to stay at MEV very long anyway. So if you micro progress, you miss out on the potential functional overreaching element of going to your MRV. Uh, and you try to stay somewhere where you can't remember MAV is mobile and there's nothing you can do to keep it from being mobile at some point. Where it used to be your MAV, you try to repeat it for three or four sessions, there's no longer anywhere close to your MAV and you need to do more. And by doing more, you accumulate more yes. fatigue, it costs you more than flush you down the toilet. So um, Areem, if you read the book, How Much Should I Train? We address every single one of these contentions uh, very, very directly of why not start, why not stay at the low end of MEV? 
Why not start at the low end, a high end of MRV? Why not just try to stay in the middle? Uh, we've, uh, I think pretty confidently explained why all of those are not the best possible ideas. So. Yeah, and Mike nailed it. I just want to reiterate, like the micro progression prevents you from actually training at MAV anymore because your MAV is still going up and then you are starting to lag behind. That's the problem. Yep. How did you know I here? All right. Uh, number three, how does isometric training affect growth? I've started doing two sets of heavy 45 to 60 second holds on traps where I just put three plates in the machine. <laughs> where I just put uh, three plates in the machine, but just hold it. So that's like think of the Oh my God. I felt my traps really well, but I'm worried that the weight will start uh, to put too much undesired stress on my skeleton. Uh, I wouldn't worry about that. Um, I'm not going to do more than two or three sets per week of them, but I'm curious how they can promote growth. I'm not doing any other heavy pulling where I need my traps to contract heavily. Uh, isometric training is a uh, robust way to increase muscle hypertrophy, but nothing beats isometric plus concentric plus eccentric training. So you're just sort of getting rid of two very effective things that you have no good reason to get rid of. So I would say that, and also there's probably a fatigue element there where just having that much loading go through your body, it's not going to fuck up your skeleton, but it's going to give you lots of axial fatigue and it's fatigue you don't need. So just lighten the load, do actual concentric, eccentric and isometric uh, shrugs with a bit of a top hold with dumbbells or barbells. And that's the best way to grow your traps. You know, you don't grow your quads by isometrically pressing on a leg press that's loaded more than you can lift. So why the fuck would you grow your traps or really anything else like that, James? Yeah, and that, that protocol sucks. 45 <laughs> to 60 seconds? That's My God. It's brutal. You're, it's you're brutal for no reason. What are you doing? Getting Cut that out. Um, all right, number four. I'm just asking. <laughs> I feel because, like we're reprimanding him. Like, what are yeah, you doing? Bad. Um, I'm just asking this because I'm curious how uh, you can feel free not to answer if it takes up too much time. How much more muscle can someone grow if they were literally in a lab getting fed directly through the bloodstream and sleeping all day? And the only stress they would have be getting from training wouldn't they have much bigger MAVs. Eh, uh, they wouldn't have bigger MAVs. Uh, the magnitude of the growth from any given volume would be higher. But I suspect that if your life is not completely insane, you would grow 90 to 95% as much as you would living in a laboratory. Um, as long as you don't have any crazy stress, eat enough food, you don't have any crazy cardio component, your girlfriend's not like stabbing you in the dick every hour, uh, then my wife laughed too much at that one. <laughs> Baby, what do you do when I fall asleep? Because I've been having stab wounds on my dick. And I don't know where they come from. Uh, she's laughing again. So basically, that's that's the deal, man. I just, I don't think it's I don't think it's a huge huge factor because some people and James, I'd love to hear your uh, your James rant on this. Some people basically are like, I have a day job. I can bring meals to it, and I get eight hours of sleep a night. But I have a day job, so I can't get jacked. Like Yasha, you know Yasha. <laughs> works for RP, various yes. uh, family, friends, and relatives of his. Uh, he, like, he lost a bunch of weight at some point, of course, using RP, and then eventually became employed by it. And he got into super amazing shape, which he's held this entire time. And uh, his relatives were like, oh my God, how'd you do it? He's like, well, you know, they're like, ah, well, I have a real job. So they just cut him off. Like, I have a job. I have a career, so I can't do it. He'd be like, what the fuck do you think I do? You think it's <laughs> like, it was insane that this was when his job was to install like computer voting systems across the country. So he traveled like fucking 200 days of the year. And he he still did. It was just like one of these, like, so I think some people uh, confuse optimality by five or 10 percentage points from like, you know, oh man, it's 50, 50. Like I could get double the gains if I just sat at home and, or sat in the lab and got fluids in my dick. Yeah. That's, and that's completely insane. Right. Uh, first of all, you couldn't even sleep that much if you wanted to. And if you were like medically induced into sleeping, you would have all sorts of other wackadoo problems that you probably don't <laughs> even want to deal with. The thing is like everyone, thinks they're special, right? You're special just like everyone else. Like, shut the fuck up. If you don't- We don't mean you shut the fuck up, Sarita. <laughs> yeah, no, not you. I just mean like <laughs> uh, people who, who make the, the excuse of like, oh, I have other things going on. Like everybody has other things going on, right? It's a matter of like, is it important enough to you to make the time and effort to do it? And if not, that's okay. You can just say like, you know what? I got other stuff going on that's more important, but don't make it an excuse and say like, well, I can't do it. Well, it's like everybody else has a day job. I can't everybody live like a professional family. athlete. Yeah. yeah, everybody else has other shit going on. Probably more shit than you do because you're a bum. No, I'm just kidding. But um, you know, the thing is, it's like, it's an easy out and it's an easy way of projecting your dissatisfaction with yourself onto circumstances outside of your control. The only option you have in your life is to take the control of the time and effort and focus that you have. That's it. So if you want to be more fit, 
you got to go to the gym. You got to be better with your diet. You got to be better with your lifestyle. That's it, right? And if it's not something that you can do right now, realistically, that's also fine. That's also fine. It doesn't make you a worse person or a less successful person or any of those things. But when someone says, hey, I noticed that you spend a lot of time like playing fucking PlayStation 4 when you're not working, you could probably spend 45 minutes in the gym doing that. And you're like, oh, fuck you, bro. Like, no, that's just you. You shut the fuck up. How am I going to get better at Fortnite if I do that gym shit? Yeah. So it's just like one of those things like um, I don't want to like go down a rabbit hole, but like a a bunch of people, uh, if you read a lot of self-help stuff like I do, like there's like Jocko, there's Jordan Peterson, there's all sorts of other people. It doesn't have to be them, but they all have the same kind of message, which is like, take ownership of your own shit. If you don't take ownership of it, then you have no right to complain anymore. That's it. 100%. All right, let me get to this next question. Number five from Marine. Uh, I named my horse in Minecraft after you. Don't worry, he is wearing diamond armor. So that's Marine, that's nice. Which one of us are you speaking to? Because there are two of us. Come on, here. come on. We know. Um, also, what the fuck is Minecraft? What kind of motherfucker? What other? There's a horse. There's a horse named Dr. Mike Isretel wearing diamond armor somewhere in cyberspace right now. That's pretty. Sweet. I like the diamond armor. It's a good touch. Um, I'm honored if that's indeed me. And if it's indeed James, then he's even more honored because he's a fucking nerd that knows what Minecraft is. Minecraft is one of those really weird but kind of awesome games. Do you know what it is at all? My first thought was Minesweeper, but clearly that's not the case. It's like, uh, it's like World of Warcraft, except like way creepier. Kind of. It's more like, it's like, um, it's like a world builder. It's kind of like The Sims. Do you remember The Sims? Yeah. Imagine The Sims, except you like literally build everything in the world with like a pickaxe. That sounds fun. <laughs> That's a video game, huh? Yeah, and it's You're like really pretty, selling it, James. It's like a. It's the thing is the game. It, the game actually, there's not. It's not like a straightforward where there's like a, a way to win. It's just one of those. It's it's kind of like D and D in a sense where it's like there's no real objective outside of just playing it to have fun and you just like do life. you just do it. Um, yeah. People love it. Yeah, it's like life. It's like an alternate life where you can create your own world. All right, speaking of alternate life, Mantas Pilipuitis from Lithuania. Oh, I was thinking Greece, but then he says Lithuania. Right Lithuanian Greek text. names. Dude, Lithuanian Greek names sound very, very similar. It's really trippy. I have no idea how the fuck. Those languages aren't even related from what I know, but it's really weird that like they end up with the same names. That is weird. Um, Mantas, no matter how great you become, you will only be potentially ever at your peak, the greatest Lithuanian of all times, because the greatest Lithuanian ever is Rudrunas <laughs> Savitskas. That's and so unfair. You, I'm sorry. <laughs> There's just a limit to what mortals That's can so become. Unfair. The, you guys, let me tell you guys a story. Uh, once Thanos got the Infinity Gauntlet or whatever, and he, he, it was, he came up to Zadrunas and he like snapped, and, and Zadrunas was like, uh, are you do playing music? Is that snap part of musical note? Um, that's nice. Uh, now I am winning my 50th world's strongest man. And that was it. That was the whole interaction. And Thanos just left. He's also like a city councilman in like his hometown, isn't he? He's amazing. Jesus. He's amazing. Unbelievable. One of my favorite interviews with Big Z was like, uh, he was like, he had just won the Arnold, like coming from behind. And he was like 40 at this point. And they were like, you just broke the world record on this fucking log, like the log thing where you, not, not the log press, but like frame carry where it's built of like, it's 900 pounds of timber, James. And you run up a fucking 10 degree incline. Yes. The like the crazy, uh, the yoke. Yeah. And he's like, uh, yes, uh, I winning. Uh, but before this event, I injuring my calf muscle. I tearing my calf. But uh, somehow I still have power to win. <laughs> what? <laughs> somehow you know, torn calf. <laughs> 900 pound run uphill fuck him he's the man can you imagine being his competitor and like you see him do that and you're like fuck <laughs> fuck this dude i used to love when uh before when they still had kazmaier doing the post interviews where because he'd be so intense like yeah. zadrunas i saw in your eyes the passion of a warrior who needed to pick up that yoke and walk up the hill because his family was burning and he needed to get water and you're like yes yes okay i did it <laughs> amazing Amazing. All right, Mantas, enough Zidrunas talk. Uh, some background information before the questions. 
I started training at the age of 16. My broad jump was 180 centimeters. During that time, most of my physical activity came from physical education classes at school. After six months of following a plyometric routine online, nice, I got a 265 centimeter broad jump. Jesus. Then I joined a gym, and after a year of linear progression, I achieved a 300 centimeter broad jump. I was fucker could jump. Of- right. Super Mario Montes over here. Seriously. I was afraid of slow intermediate gains and did a bunch of resets on a program with similar loading parameters as five by five. And that got me into a six month plateau. Yeah. Slow intermediate gains. You basically engineered yourself by doing beginner gains all over again. Uh, Then I switched to a similar program to the Texas method in five months. I acquired a 315 centimeter broad jump. Number one. Oh, we got uh, 13 questions. This is great. Should I rapid fire these James? Actually, Crickets. James, you're going to rapid fire these because uh, these are all sports specific. Okay. What yearly rate of progress could I expect? How fast should your rate of progress decrease? Is a lifetime goal of 375 centimeter broad jump totally unrealistic? You know what? These are impossible. This one's an impossible question to ask because the inter-individual variability is so massive we cannot give you a hard number. I mean, you've already increased your broad jump by roughly 50 centimeters, which most people may not do in their lifetime, honestly. So um, it's fair to say that you've already increased a lot. The rate of inc- uh, increase is only going to go down over time. Um, and 375, oh, actually, you've increased it more than that. Sorry, I was looking at the other numbers. Um, I would say it's feasible given how you seem to have like a really good proclivity to jumping. But I mean, that might be one of those things where you get to like 350 and then 375 might require you to move heaven and earth. And it might take like 10 years at that point. Ooh. You know what I mean? You know, it's just, it's hard to say. So hold okay. on, James. I'm sorry. No, you're good. Let me read these numbers again. 375 centimeter broad jump. So the world record in the broad jump, as far as I can tell, is 373 centimeters. Oh, so he's trying to break a world record. Yeah. Mm. I was just basing it off of the numbers that he's already been doing. Yeah. It's held by an uh, African-American gentleman who is probably has better jumping genetics than you. My apologies. Yeah. So in that case, I mean, like I didn't know the, the numbers going into that. Uh, I would say there's a reason why it's a world record. And it's because it's uh, only one person has done it. So I would still think that like, given your, your, your increases from 265 to 315, like you still probably got plenty of progression in the tank, but that's going to drop each year. I mean, like you'd be lucky to start seeing like five centimeter increases per year of really good training at that point. You know what I mean? So and that's just the way it goes. So uh, let's go to number two. What are your thoughts on accommodating resistance for broad jump training, especially for box squats? So I know Mike has opinions on uh, accommodating resistance training. I personally think it's mostly a waste of time. It's something that uh, was useful for people who did equipped powerlifting because it's, it was similar in terms of the loading scheme from using equipped uh methods. But I think for people who are trying to do more track and field type events like yourself and people who are lifting, uh, you know, unequipped, I think it's mostly a waste. Unfortunately, I think you would have a way bigger bang for your buck, just getting strong as fuck, raw, powerful as fuck, raw, and not messing with any of that stuff. Mike, do you agree? Yep. Cool. I never do heavy pulls from the floor, but I do some variations in, of Olympic lifts. Could that limit my rate of progress? So if the question is like, do you need to do the lifts from the floor? Absolutely not. The reason being, and this is actually something that's pretty well documented in research, is that the, um, the peak power that you produce in those movements is from what they call the power position or what's more uh, commonly called the second pull. And the second pull can be hit from a number of positions, whether you start on the floor, whether you start from the knee or from above or below the knee or from the power position itself. So you can actually get the same potential benefits with less uh, technique complications from just training the partial derivatives than doing kind of the full movements themselves. So I don't think that you're limiting yourself from not doing things on the floor. Uh, especially if you find that doing like the full technique from the floor is technically challenging for you. Uh, Number four, what are some good reasons on a good broad jump or what are some good resources on a good broad jump technique? 
you know what? You got me on this one. No clue. I've been studying broad jump videos of NFL Combine. Uh, I think those guys just are good jumpers. I don't know if they've actually been training broad jump very well. Maybe, maybe not. It seems that everybody jumps differently. Is the technique largely individual? I think there are some commonalities that most coaches could walk you through on good broad jump technique um, in terms of like, where your center of mass is, like when to start the counter movement, uh, the, the appropriate time scale in which your body tilts forward before you actually hit the triple extension. I'm sure people have thought and analyzed these things through and through. I don't fucking know. Mike, anything? Um, nothing that comes to mind. I think Alex Harrison of RP might have some insight at some point. Maybe a guy to reach out to. But um, there's almost certainly a standardized technique that is best, but because it is only used in the NFL combine, I don't think a whole lot of people uh, are keen on what the standardized technique is. It's not, broad jump is unfortunately just not, or whatever, that's not unfortunately. It just happens to not be something that is internationally competitive. Uh, so there's been no competitive drive to winnow you know, the technique down to what's optimal. But I'm sure there are some good folks that, that know. You know, some, somebody uh, also took up is Chad Wesley Smith, juggernaut mm -hmm. training. Uh, he might have some resources out on broad jumping or what the broad jump technique looks like. Yeah. There's, there, I, I don't know of any, but I would guess, I mean, I've seen, I've seen countless plyometric technique books. I can't think, I didn't look through them specifically, so I'm sure there's stuff out there. Um, number five, are isometrics always suboptimal for hypertrophy in the sense that you are substituting isometrics for full range of motion, concentric, eccentric movements. I think if you incorporate them with those movements and don't spend a huge chunk of your, um, resources and MRV doing isometric specific stuff. It's not always suboptimal, but I think the bigger bang for your buck, especially if you are doing more athletic endeavors, not just hypertrophy training for its own sake, will of course be the full range of motion, concentric, eccentric stuff. And then you can train isometrics as needed by your sport or desire. I think for core training, there's no difference in the rules here. Um, how important is body fat for the broad jump? Uh, it's, uh, I'll get to it in a second. I am around 15, 18%. Should I be leaner year round? Would that maximize my yearly progress or cut a little bit before peaking? So at every sport, every activity, every athletic endeavor has an optimal body fat or body weight to strength or power ratio. So in this case, you're looking at body weight to power ratio. So I don't know what that is. It's something that is absolutely out there. I bet if I spent an hour looking it up, I could find it and figure it out and tell you. I would guess that it's probably for a male closer to maybe eight to 12% somewhere in there. So 15 to 18% is not necessarily bad, but you're probably carrying around a little bit more fat than you need to be maximally powerful or explosive. So I would say um, in any of the movement, any of the sprinting, jumping or gymnastics type movements, power to weight ratio is king or queen, depending on who you are. And I think uh, it, it wouldn't hurt to try and get down closer to 10% body fat or less for competition purposes for other, you know, for the rest of the year, if you if you hang out comfortably at 15%, that's fine. No big deal. Mike, do you have any, uh, anything you want to throw in there? Uh, no, man. I think you covered that one really well. Cool. Number seven, why are many elite track and field athletes relatively skinny? Because of the power to weight ratio issue that we just talked about. Does the need for hypertrophy rapidly diminish when an athlete progresses in their career? Um, not necessarily. So the need for hypertrophy, again, is mandated by the power to weight ratio, especially in track and field. So what you might find is that somebody coming out of high school who did pretty good in track and field um, is a skinny mini right? And they were just uh, naturally kind of explosive, but you might find that actually gaining like 10 pounds of muscle mass makes them incredibly explosive and doesn't actually weigh them down that much, right? On the other hand, you might have some guy who, who was like a fast football player who carries around a lot of excess weight and is like super muscled. And you might find that actually even losing some muscle mass, especially in like the less important, like the upper body, um, might actually be beneficial in terms of power to weight ratio for something like sprinting. Um, not recommending that you go forth and try and lose muscle, but that is a, a feasible scenario. So the need for hypertrophy is coincides with the need for power to body weight ratio. Sometimes it's good to go up. Sometimes it's good to go down. Everybody's different. And there are normative standards. So if you look up like 40 meter hurdles, you will find that more often than not, world caliber athletes are a certain height, a certain weight, and a certain body fat percentage. And this is all normative stuff that you can kind of look up. So uh, power to body weight, man. Can't say enough. Number eight, 
Since I've trained daily undulating periodization, I have one light session a week, which mitigates almost all of the fatigue. Well, that's pretty sweet. After a mesocycle, I usually drop the weight by 10% and skip a deload. What? Hold on. He doesn't yeah. deload. Yeah, I have a burp like, that's not coming out. Okay, so, we, we, so essentially he kind of just reduces the intensity and doesn't actually deload. It feels that this approach reduces all of the underlying fatigue. Could this mean that my training is not taxing enough? Yes! Ding, 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 ding. You got it, my man. That means that you are chronically under training. Now, I suspect given how much talk of jumping and kind of track and field stuff you do, you're probably trying to overemphasize preparedness for jumping and maybe underemphasize the underlying characteristics that potentiate jumping, like gaining muscle mass, gaining strength, gaining power, and then eventually transitioning back to jumping. So I would say if that's the case, if you're always trying to maintain a low fatigue state so you can always jump really hard on training days, that would be a poor non face potentiated strategy. You might want to think about adding some face potentiation where you have some harder training, hitting your MRVs. And this is, this is, this is also true. I mean, in the, in your current training, like if you don't need to deload, even if you're trying to maintain a high level of preparedness, you're still running into the same problem. You're probably not training hard enough. So think about it. Maybe think about face potentiating your training a little bit more as well. Number nine, why does nobody overload in a microcycle by increasing the rest intervals? Overload in a microcycle by increasing the rest intervals. Well, some people just do that for maintaining a high intensity during their training, which is not uncommon. It's because of systemic fatigue. For instance, I feel ready to do my next set after two minutes, but if I rested for a minute longer, I could add a few reps. If I had three sessions, <laughs> Mike's going to chime in here. If I had three sessions in a week for a particular body part, why should I not rest two, three, and four minutes respectively? No time constraints. Because you can just do more sets with a normal amount of rest in the same amount of time. And by doing more sets, you get the same number of highly effective reps in half or a third of the time. So you can do it this way. It's just grossly inefficient. Yeah. And so like, um, it's also an interesting question because you might be doing it. You might be thinking about it backwards where if you could have higher intensity or more voluminous sets, why not start with maybe four minutes, especially if you're somebody like yourself and you're trying to jump more, uh, it seems to be have like a jump focus program. I would maybe just consider maybe adding a minute to what you're already doing and then just locking that in and being consistent with it from that point on. That way you can maintain a really high intensity without compromising your volume too much. There's some sweet spot that you have to figure out for yourself where it just becomes too time inefficient, like Dr. Mike said. Um, generally, for people who are in strength power sports, we say, uh, we kind of favor a very high level of preparedness per set, but that doesn't necessarily mean taking five minutes every time. It just means like, make sure you're ready to go and that you can go hard every time. For hypertrophy purposes, you might not be as constrained by that. Number 10, should you increase the loads of Olympic lifts that you have never practiced fast to hit, a, that you have never practiced fast to hit a slightly lower than your usual RIR or stay almost an empty bar for a few months? So let me see if I'm understanding this question. Should you increase the loads of Olympic lifts that you have never practiced? So first of all, you never increase the load on a lift that you have not practiced. The first and foremost thing that you have to do is learn how to do the technique appropriately. And then load increases come with increases in competency on that lift, especially in the Olympic lifts where there's a lot more impact and a lot more just chance of injury than doing something like a squat or a deadlift. So I would not increase the load on a lift until my athlete has demonstrated their various milestones of competency on that lift, right? So that's number one. Uh, and then is he asking if you should just do it faster so that you hit a hot, uh, you hit a more intense RIR? Is that the question? That's what it looks like to me. Uh, still, I think no, because uh, you're unfortunately at some point, you're just too low. If you're using like an unloaded bar and just trying to move as fast as possible, uh, you're not reaping the benefits of those lifts. Those lifts are meant to more be kind of in like the 80, 70% range of the power spectrum yeah. of what you could be doing. So you're kind of, you might as well just be sprinting or jumping at that point unresisted rather than trying to do the, the Olympic lifts. Number 11, would it be a better idea to do all sets with the same RIR by varying the reps or to keep reps the same and achieve a similar average RIR? For example, I can hit a five by five with RIR three, three, two, two, one respectively. Would it be superior to do six reps at the first set and drop the reps in later sets to match an RR of two. So I think for strength and hypertrophy purposes, 
it's better generally to have a preset intensity and let your reps and, you know, auto-regulate your volume overall around that intensity. I don't really see the big benefit of doing that unless you're working at really, really low volumes. And at that point, we do something that we call wave loading, where it's not really an RIR issue. We just kind of fluctuate the intensity of each set. So let's just say like, you don't have a lot of volume to work with. Maybe you're doing kind of like a three by three or three by two, right? Um, One of the things you can do is say like, okay, well, one of these sets is going to be at like 90% and the other set's going to be at like 92.5%. That's not a change in RIR. It's just changing the load within kind of a spectrum of operational loads for that day. I wouldn't necessarily change the RIR just because it becomes impossible to really track your fatigue at that point. So it's like you do a five by five and you, you finish your last set at RIR of one, what are you going to do the rest of that session? Probably not a whole lot, or at least it's going to be a complete wash um, when you're trying to track your performance on some things and manage the fatigue. So I would say have a pre-programmed intensity and let your reps and sets kind of fall around that in an auto-regulated fashion. What well, body weight exercises generally have the best FF, SFR for abdominal training. SFR is an individualized thing. So, you know, there are some that I, that Dr. Mike and I could just kind of rapid fire and say, these are ones that have worked with, for us and for our clients in the past, but at oh, the same James. time, yeah. So I think there's like modified candlesticks. I think like hanging leg or knee raises tend to work well. Um, weight behind the head, decline sit-ups. Those are ones that have worked historically for, for me and some of my clients, but that doesn't mean that they're going to work for you. So SFR is always a guess and check thing. Number 13, should complete novices add weight and reps every workout, for example, every two days at their MEV and not be, excuse me, not be very concerned about MRV or deloads. Hmm. Well, so just fundamentally, the last part, I I don't agree with it all. You should always be concerned about both of those things, even if they're not completely necessary, Uh, especially with novices where part of being a novice is just gaining experience and learning about the training process and the things that go into that. And so we, we deload our novices. Maybe they don't deload as frequently as some other people, but we get them in the habit of deloading so that they know that this is something that you're going to be doing and you should be used to doing. Um, MRV is something like, yeah, maybe you're not training close enough to MRV for it to be a major concern, but to just say that it's not a concern would be a big mistake, in my opinion. Should novices add weight and reps every workout? No, absolutely not. Again, novices are novices because they don't have any experience doing what you're doing. They need to demonstrate increasing competency in all of the things that they're doing before you really start adding a lot of weight. Adding reps is something that we generally do in an auto-regulated fashion. And for a beginner, there's not a huge incentive to do either because they're going to get massive beginner gains from very, very little. Once they start training for, Dr. Mike, you can chime in here when, if you think I'm way off. I would say after about a year, you can start taking about, uh, you know, weight increases and rep and set increases a little bit more seriously, but That first year, it's really about show me that you can execute this technique. We're going to add a little bit of weight on the bar, or maybe we're going from a broomstick or a, you know, a training bar to a regular bar now, or maybe we're adding five pounds on each side, but I want you to demonstrate that you can do this technique consistently, injury-free with the mechanics that I'm asking you to do. And once you do that, then, and I can, I feel that I can walk away and you're going to do what I asked you to do. Then we can talk about adding rep sets and weight more, more linearly across time. Yeah. We don't add a lot of reps. We stay with very similar reps sets of five to 10, because if you do add a lot of reps, it tends to fatigue them inside the set and the technique breaks down. Uh, We tend to not push closer and closer to failure because that also tends to fuck them up. And we tend not to push volume too high because that tends to fuck them up. Approaching very close to MRV is not a very good idea. So what you end up doing is you do build up sets over time slowly, uh, mostly because they get really good at uh, doing the sets and it becomes quite easy and you can do more and learn more. But the best way to do that is probably expand the number of sessions if you can, ideally, but also just sets per session is fine. Fundamentally, you're going to increase load a lot for beginners, not because you're pushing the load, but because they're going to be competent and a good technique and no longer challenge by that load. Beginners, I like to say, earn their load increases through uh, exemplary technique competency. Uh, once they are good at, good, good at a certain technique and you notice that the bar was moving super fast, like they're 10 RIR or more, then you put more load on the bar. And of course, they're going to put like hundreds of pounds on each lift in the first year or whatever, or, you know, dozens of pounds on each lift in the first year, but that'll be from them earning that. And then after about a year or so of training, then you can push the load proactively getting closer to failure because they're already, the technique's not going to break down nearly as easily. Yeah, absolutely agree. 
All right. Thank you, James. That was a, that was a hell of a, a lot of questions. Ooh. Khalid B says, hello, docs. I'm hoping you're well and healthy. Thanks, Khalid. Thanks, dude. I'd like to start off by thanking you for the advice you gave me a few weeks ago. I have been lifting for three years with high volume. First year was an inconsistent bro split. I was just spinning my wheels in the whole time without seeing performance increases. I started training with 20 plus sets for each body part and just stuck with that for through my lifting career. And even after I started RP training, I would start somewhere close to 15 sets and go up to 25 sets. My performance wasn't decreasing, so I didn't think it was an issue. After Dr. Mike's advice, after hiring uh, my coach who was advising me to do the same, I've lowered my volume dramatically to about half of what I do and I'm now making great progress. My performance oh. is that's pretty sweet. Oh. My Great. is increasing a lot more now than it did uh, after de-learning from the high volume. I think I'm one of the ones, Dr. Mike says, who have the best at after responses in a low fatigue state. I am now doing four day upper lower split with only 10 weekly sets for chest, 12 for back, nine shoulders, six biceps, six triceps, and 20 legs. Thanks for the advice. Good stuff, man. Awesome, dude. Uh, all right, on to the questions. Uh, number one, I read somewhere that mixing strength and hypertrophy training in the same session is not good as it sends a mixed adaptive signal to the body. Is this true? It probably is true to some extent. Um, if someone, for someone who's not an elite power lifter or bodybuilder and wants to focus on both size and strength, for instance, starting the session with heavy compounds at five reps and then moving on to volume work in that session down to 15, would that not be effective? It is better to split them into a power day and a hypertrophy day. So it's not power, it's strength, just to be very clear on that. Splitting into strength and hypertrophy days is probably better uh, than doing some strength and some hypertrophy. And then splitting it further into distinct phases of strength and hypertrophy is also even better than that. Uh, so give that some thought, but it, there's not a problem. As long as you do the strength first, hypertrophy after, you get a good mix of both. So if you're not super professional, whatever, that's totally fine. You can make it a little better by splitting up the sessions and even better still by splitting up the muscle cycles. And I think splitting up the sessions is not only good from a performance standpoint, but from a fatigue management standpoint as well. Cause it's like, when are you going to get a break from doing the fives, right? You should have those distinct days where it's like, okay, I got a heavy day. I got lighter days. Yeah. Works really Absolutely. Well. Uh, number two, how big of a role does genetics play in building size? Huge. Uh, literally. If we assume two individuals doing the same training and diet, would you say uh, the one with the better genetics would gain double the amount or is it like 30 to 50% more? Uh, so it depends on how much better the genetics are. But I uh, will say that when you talk about minute variables in program design, like five versus six days a week, two RIR, one RIR, things like that, they're undetectable in the realm of changing genetics. Uh, they're just not detectable. That, that's how powerful genetics um, is. I would say genetic variation accounts for about as much difference in training or in muscle mass as doing everything almost completely wrong versus almost completely optimal. That is to say people with incredible genetics that do everything almost completely wrong will be roughly the same muscular size as people with pretty bad genetics that do things uh, optimally. And I would say actually genetics is more impactful even than that on muscularity. Uh, so it's a genetics even more important than that. But on, unless you really have really bad genetics, it's at least that powerful. Let me give you an example. Um, I was in Chicago one time for leisure. When I was, James, are you okay? Is there someone walking in your yard or some shit? Mel and Doug are filling up the hot tub, and I can't help but notice that the water is looking very brown. Oof. Because <laughs> I just, I see the water level rising, and I'm like, hmm. Brown hmm. water. I can't wait. Mm -hmm. um, so I was in Chicago for a leisure trip, and a gentleman came out to my, I was like 18, and a gentleman came out to myself and my friend, uh, who was there with me in Chicago, and this guy was probably homeless, um, and uh, almost certainly a drug addict, and I would bet had never trained with weights, or certainly recently had not trained with weights in years. And uh, he was probably about five eight, five nine. I would estimate about one eighty. Uh, looked like a competition bodybuilder with the body fat and the muscle bellies and the full development and everything. And it's just who he was. Like he was literally just born to be like that. That's the kind of guy that if he trained, he would be a drug-free 220, damn near on stage. And if he took drugs, he would be a guy you know from the magazines, right? Um, many people yeah, would agree. never reach a lean 180 at 5'9". Suffice to say, most people wouldn't. Uh, so genetics is more important than steroids. It's more important than everything. It's even more important than if you train right or wrong. Genetics is huge. However, as with almost all uh, normally distributed variables, most people have mediocre genetics or pretty decent genetics and somewhere in between the two, right? Very few people have elite genetics and very few people have very, very shady genetics, but absolutely does happen. So there's that. Um, you can always follow up with another question later to maybe if we didn't beat that to death. Yeah, that's, that's spot on. All right. 
Uh, number three, would you be able to quantify the impact of stress on building size? I know Laura's one's on MRV, for instance, but again, with the same scenario, let's say two individuals are following the same training and diet plan. One of them has high stress and anxiety, the other doesn't, but no stress individual gain more, even if the stress individual responds better to low volume. Uh, so, so you're mixing two variables there of like genetics and stress. It's very hard to tell because we need to know magnitudes. Um, I will say that good muscle building genetics can cancel out a whole lot more stress than a low stress lifestyle can help with shitty genetics. James, correct me if I'm wrong here, but what we tend to find is people with pretty bad genetics, nothing really helps them all that much, drugs included. Um, and people yeah. with good genetics, nothing really hurts them all that much. Uh, stress included. Yeah, they don't slow down. So, so it's one of those, the genetics is a real solidifying. It's almost like a, what's that called? Like a strange attractor variable where it, like any, any, anything you insert good genetics to it, like it re reconforms reality to be like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> like you don't need food or rest. Now take any person of any given genetics and those other things absolutely do matter. And they matter more at the extremes, just like genetics does. So if you take a person with elite muscle building genetics and you stress them out to the point where they sleep one hour a day and they're tortured the rest of the time, they will wither down to something that's less muscular than someone with the worst muscle building genetics. Uh, but that's unre it's unlikely. So if we're talking about the uh, best answer to this question, probably like a real world, like real world, like I have a stressful job. The wife's always yelling at me. I don't know my fucking kids' names, shit like that. Like you can still get jacked as fuck if you have good genetics. And if you, uh, you know, have pretty bad genetics, uh, just like low end of mediocre, you could have a little completely stressful lifestyle. It will maximize your gains, but you're still never going to compete with the guys with really elite genetics. That's just what it comes down to. If anything, just genetics are the most important variable for muscle growth, short of getting enough food to eat and being alive uh, and under enough sleep to not die. <laughs> so, yeah. And I, I would feel confident saying like, if you had two identical twins and they did everything the same and one had a high stress and one had a low stress, like the hot, the, the low stress one's probably going to grow more or the, you know, the other one's going to have more interference. Five, 10 pounds more muscle or something, not like 80. Yeah, exactly. 80 that's genetics. Lifetime of training, genetics and drugs are the big variables there and, and, and eating enough to, to gain weight. Yeah. All right. Jordan Negri Leonard. Yeah, that's like kind of a spicy name. So many not. spices. Yeah. But, but then Jordan Leonard by itself doesn't sound that great. All right. I mean, it doesn't sound that great. That was really mean. It doesn't yeah. sound that exotic, which is say worse. Um, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. First part is not really a question, more just a remark of our previous webinar. When Dr. Mike said he can click his bones when he squeezes his glutes, I can do something similar in my thoracic spine when I squeeze my scapula together. Cool, it's really satisfying. Um, I'm sorry if any of these questions have been asked before. It's good that you apologized beforehand. We demand reverence here. <laughs> plus. Um, when programming in the conventional deadlift and taking into account volume for muscles, which muscles would the deadlift count towards specifically? For example, I know quads, glutes, hams, and back, but I'm looking more for specifics as to which back muscles. A little bit of the lats, uh, tons of traps, uh, the entire traps, mid traps, upper traps, lower traps, um, and probably rhomboids and stuff like that to some extent, and majorly, majorly, majorly the spinal erectors. So tear is major and lats, just a tiny little bit, uh, not much, mostly your uh, the entire trap complex. So actually, if you look at the back, uh, it's this big cable that goes all the way from your traps down to your ass in the middle. That's the uh, spinal erector to trap complex. That's really the meat and potatoes of deadlifting. And the rhomboids, the muscles that control the scapula to some extent are also hit. Everything else is a very minor thing. So what we don't want people to do is people say like, people have said this like every now and again in bodybuilding forms, completely insane shit. Like, how do I get my lats to grow? People are like, you got a deadlift for a big back. It's like, oh, motherfucker, are you serious? It's not even a, it's not even dynamic exercise. It's isometric for the lats at best. And it's one of those things where it's like, okay, if you have a really thick back, but you don't have big lats that sweep out, don't fucking deadlift, okay? Uh, that's not Me. Good, so, yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. So, so, so that's the thing. Yeah, and it's just kind of like the, the sumo question came up earlier in the webinar. This is one where if you're trying to do it by the numbers, you, you count it as deadlift and then just auto-regulate everything else. For sure. When programming conventional, okay, uh, what would, how would you do program rotated cuff work into a mezzo? I'm not sure if those are deep muscles. We only concern us with superficial muscularity here at RP. Um, James? You could, you could theoretically treat them like any other muscle group. The problem with those like deeper and smaller muscle groups is that like uh, using RIR has major limitations because you go from like five to zero, like very quickly. Um, so 
it's one of those things like ultimately like you're still controlling for frequency, still controlling for intensity, still controlling for volume, sets and reps. Um, you just shit, do so it on a much smaller volume. scale. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's just, a, it's the same stuff, just scaled down massively. Yeah. And be careful. I uh, say, how would you program rotator cuff work into a meso, not just by itself. Remember that the rotator cuff muscles are used for everything else that you do in the shoulder. So be very careful, very ginger, and maybe do less shoulder work in general and more specific rotator cuff work if you need. But then the question comes back to, do you need specific rotator cuff programming? And when, uh, when James and I were PhD students, it was hammered into us over and over that compound heavy basic movements really just take care of almost everything you need in your rotator cuff that is not clinically significant. So if you rotator cuffs are a problem and they're abnormally weak and a physical therapist told you this, then yeah, the physical therapist probably take care of your programming. But yes. if you think your rotator cuffs are some kind of weak link and you need to make them bigger and stronger, but you can do pull-ups with 200 pounds and 50 pounds of that is extra weight added and you can do bench press and lateral raises and everything's fine, you probably don't have rotator cuff. Uh, muscular uh, weakness issues at all. I don't think. Yeah. And, and I would just do them generally at the end of every session, because as Dr. Mike said, if you're doing heavy compounds and stuff already, you're going to be hitting them. So it's probably not in your best interest to pre fatigue them. If you're going to be doing like heavy pressing or anything like that, um, I would always just do them at the end. This last question is a bit different. How would you, how would someone go about getting into your line of work? Uh, well, you got to meet a pimp because you can't do the shit on the streets by yourself. You know what I'm saying? You need protection. Now, you're going to have to pay this motherfucker some money. He might get upset every now and again and fucking put his hands up. That's where you got to stand up for yourself, cover your face. What was I saying? That uh, was another life. Um, for reference, I'm in a final career of math degree. Uh, sorry, final year of a math degree. I did think a couple of years ago about changing to sports science degree, but never did. I would love to re do research in sports science, but I'm not sure how to get there from where I am. Also, it depends on what you want to do. Uh, yeah, it, into it might your be line too of work. far gone. Right. Well, so like it depends on what you mean by our line of work. What you can do is um, potentially you can uh, contact uh, Brad Schoenfeld's uh, master's program in strength and conditioning at um, uh, uh, Lehman College in the Bronx and ask them what kind of prerequisites they'd like to see for a master's student and go to school extra to get those prerequisites and then apply. Um, I will actually be a professor in that program in a couple of months. So, so there's that one, one thing, right? You can do to get a formal degree and you can do that with other master's programs. It might be a big uphill road where you might need to take like another two years of prerequisites to become eligible. Um, however, yes, that's, that's, that's if you want to do research. Now, once you get a master's degree, then you get a PhD and then you can do research. But James and I don't do much research anymore. I do a little bit. Um, uh, I'm a co-author on papers of various sorts and do data analysis. I don't actually get in the lab much uh, or at all. Um, so I don't, James and I aren't exactly in that line of work, but you can get on a similar line of work James and I are in the line of work where we help people enhance their fitness. The way you can get into that is you just watch everything you can on RP Plus, every single video, read a bunch of books, all the shit we recommend, and then start, you know, you're already training yourself, get more jacked, get leaner. Um, if people inquire or you can ask people if they need your help and all of a sudden you have some clients, do your best job with clients, eventually you get really good at training clients, you have success stories, if people want more and more of your help, you get a website, so on and so on, and then all of a sudden you're a competitor to RP and we send uh, Dr. Jen Case over to kill you in the middle of the night while you sleep. Success. Yeah. I, yeah. I think like, you know, your life is your own decisions, but if it was me, I would say you're the amount of prerequisite stuff that you would have to make up. It's just, it's, you're so far gone. I don't think it would be a necessarily a good use of your time unless you were trying to do a complete career overhaul. Cause we're talking, even with like an advanced math degree, you're going to be taking numerous undergraduate classes, numerous master's level classes. Like you're talking like two years of exercise physiology, uh, motor learning, motor control, biomechanics, like all sorts of it's stuff that's, you, I'm not saying you're not capable of doing those things. It's just going to be a huge, huge time commitment. Uh, so it might be more in your best interest to maybe not do lab stuff so much as like just looking into being a fitness person. Like, and that's kind of, you know, that's more or less what Mike and I do. We have, we have education in the field and we can help break things down that are hard to understand into easier concepts. That's like what the volume landmarks are. But for somebody like you, man, it's, it's a hard sell for me. I, I, I would feel bad saying, yeah, come on down. Like here's a bunch of schools you could go to. Cause it's like, fuck, you're going to be in school for, for like 10 years at this point. Yeah. So I think Mike's suggestion was a good alternative. All right. Ready for YouTube. Oh my goodness. Let's do it. Okay, I should probably do the screen share, huh? Yeah. Can 
You see it. Trained like a machine. Yeah, that's Jared Feather in the commercial we filmed. Um, all right, so let's get into the good ones. Three questions. This is not a question, but I'd like to read this because I think it's really important. Uh, this guy says, I used to think I was a hard gainer when I first started lifting. I just needed more of a caloric surplus and more protein. Also more volume in my training. Basically, I fixed everything or got good and out of nowhere, I was no longer a hard gainer. And that's the thing. That's why like, we, we invented the James Hoffman skeptical squint. Like when you say I'm not gaining and it's just kind of obvious to you why you're not, it's just not obvious to us why you're, that you're doing everything properly. It's not obvious to us why we're not doing everything properly. So just it's, it's good to to know that maybe what you think is an intractable problem really is just like, are you sure you're doing the basics right? Sometimes you're like, no, and it's like, okay, what the fuck are you asking about? Like, you know, the, the spoiler on your Toyota Tercel is not gonna make you go 180 miles an hour. You need a new car, right? That's the thing. You still there, James? James Hoffman, and he's back. All right. James, turn on your microphone. I bet. Okay, sweet. No worries. All right. So I, I, I rant about anything. Um, the right. show goes on without me. That's right. Uh, let's see. First question. Hey, docs. When auto regulating <laughs> <Damn> you, DSL. <laughs> when auto regulating for gymnastic strength exercises, how would you recommend using RP RIR exercises such as the front lever and is that called planche, James? A planche? Is that how you say it? James Hoffman. Where are you looking? Sorry. Uh, old YouTube channel. What? No, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out which question you were reading. Oh, there we go. Automated gymnastics. How would you recommend using it? Um, oh, I see. Yeah. So this, like you, you basically would swap out OIR for kind of like percentage of maximal effort or like RPE. It would be a very similar kind of assessment. So um, in some of these cases, you might not actually be even remotely close to hitting a maximal effort on some of those movements just because they might not be challenging or dynamic enough. Like you might be able to just do it with your eyes closed and it's no big deal. So at that point, it's more of an issue of like the, the, the number of repetitions and the quality of repetitions, whether or not they were executed at, you know, in, whether it was a, a routine or a drill or, you know, whatever it was, if they were executed at the level that you were seeking, then that's a good rep and that's a good, you know, basically a productive set. Um, and I would just do something like that. It's very difficult in some cases where some of the movements are not truly a maximal effort, you know, so it's, it can be hard to use something like RPE, RIR in those cases. And so at that point, you look more for quality and quantity of efforts. Very cool. Riley says, MRV increases as we increase frequency. What happens with MEV, minimum effective volume? I suspect that it changes very little, but if I had to guess, I think MEV uh, for the week goes down uh, if you increase frequency because you're very frequently re-stimulating. Uh, and if you frequently re-stimulate a process, that probably doesn't require as much of a stimulus at any one time. But I don't think that that's a meaningfully large difference in most contexts. Yeah, I agree. Ooh, can I see this with this guy, Sue? trying to give me a call out here. James, could you just use the data from your phone to connect your PC to the internet? Just a suggestion. Check there ain't no out. phone service check, out here, check, homie. Check, Are you out of your mind? Response. Check out the response that uh, Carrie Jamerger <laughs> gave. Yeah, oh, okay, Carrie Jamerger. Sue, I think you said, Montana, up here you're remote enough to need a fiber drop to your house. Cell service isn't going to be great either. Yeah, no, homie, I get no cell service. I barely, I had a range extender put in for my house. And even then I would only get an LTE signal like once a day if my phone was touching the range extender and then it would go away. So, I mean, bro, we're talking satellite and DSL out here for the time being. Yep. Uh, That's why I dropped out already. <laughs> right. Hype it asks, is there a place where you speak at Renaissance as Renaissance periodization about creating a macro cycle? Yes, on RP plus, RP plus, RP plus, and there'll be more of that on YouTube as we transition RP plus to YouTube. One last question. There's a James. bunch of videos of me do, just doing it for you. Yeah, that's true. Oh yeah, that's right. Um, uh, where 
there's a good question down here. Um, okay. I've been training for over a year. Didn't see much results after six months. Uh, throughout this time, I kept the volume constant at about 15 sets per muscle per week. And I've bumped it up to 30 sets for back and shoulders and over 24 arms and chest. And I'm finally seeing progress again, but my sessions have become super long. Over 140 sets for systemic MRV. And later, later third of my session is basically shit. I was considering twice a day training, but I've heard from you guys in multiple instances as an advanced tool and I'm considered a beginner. But most accounts, what should I do? Thanks in advance. Uh, you're not a beginner by most accounts. Uh, beginner and mean advanced is really judged on how quickly and easily you make gains. And if you're struggling to make gains within the first six months of your training, you can consider yourself advanced after the first six months of training. So it, you do whatever you need to do in order to make gains. Now, to the earlier comments about the James skepticism, I'm not sure if you're doing a great job with everything else. Um, you know, if you're doing a fine job with the basics, I think multiple sessions may be some place for you to go to get better gains. Uh, yeah, I don't disagree with Mike, but my skeptic, my skeptical radar is going off here. Um, what, what's this guy's name? Shrihari? Uh, my man, what I suspect that you're doing is just having what ultimately boils down to very low SFR choices for your, whatever it is that you're doing. So I suspect, I don't know, but I would say that, um, whatever exercises that you're choosing or the technique in which you are executing them is not great. That could be a thing. So for beginners, like if you're not seeing pretty good beginner gains and you're doing a shitload of stuff and you're considering doing two days. Cause uh, you're a skeptical. Signs point awesome. to like what, what you're doing. It's, it's more signs point more to you're doing a shitty job than that. Then you need advanced training that, you know what I'm saying? It's not that, it's not that it couldn't be a little bit of both, but if I was to, if my, if I had a dial and I had to point to which one, it would be like, eh, you're probably doing a shitty job. You know what I mean? And that's okay. It doesn't mean that you're, that you suck. It just means that maybe you got to go back to the drawing board a little bit. And all of us have to do that, myself included, from time to time. It's no big deal. Yep. hundred percent. Folks, that's all we have for today. Yeah, that was good. I think um, we're going to, Dr. Mike and I are going to try and play catch up a little bit. So I'm not sure if we're going to get another one this week or, or, or what, but we're going to try and get another one soon to make up for the questions that we didn't answer yet. So let's just do a quick reminder, fun, friendly reminder. We're going to switch formats starting soon on July. What did we say? July 7th. Uh, we're going to switch to primary, uh, just to YouTube only. So if you have any outstanding RP plus questions that have not got answered, or you've been sitting on it for a while, or you're like, ah, I don't, don't want to bother those guys, get those questions in because we're going to switch to YouTube and then it's going to be an upvote system based on what people think are the most interesting questions. And we're going to take the top 10 from there. So RP plus subscribers, make sure you guys submit your questions. You'll have until July 7th, I believe. And uh, we're going to backlog all the questions that have been asked that we have not gotten to yet up to that point. And then from that point on, it'll be YouTube upvotes. So make sure you guys post those questions.